Where can you find 6,000 local businesses with just one click? EverythingMidmo.com Hello and welcome to the Columbia Daily Tribune's Behind the Stripes webcast. This is Tribune beat writer Dave Matter along with sports editor Joe Waljasper. Dave, uh, Missouri coming off 38-12 to victory over Kansas State. And I guess the kind of the big story from the game was the play of Denario Alexander again, back-to-back 200-yard games. Right. Um, I think there's now there's kind of a, maybe after that game a big push to, to see if this guy is, a, is he an All-American, is he a Bolitnikoff candidate, which you can, you can address that topic. And maybe even where where do you think he stands now in MU history at that position? Well, I think he's an All-American candidate for sure. You know, those those lists are starting to go together right now. And I think he's up there nationally with some of the most productive receivers in the country. You talk about Jordan Shipley at Texas, a guy that everyone's been more familiar with throughout the course of the year around the country just because of plays for Texas and mm -hmm. he's been on the national stage before. I think Golden Tate at Notre Dame, the wide receiver there, He's kind of taken some of the spotlight off Jimmy Clausen, the quarterback, as their season's gone on and kind of not gone so well, but he's putting up great numbers. And then I think you got to put Alexander right in the mix there. I mean, if you look at the list of guys on the finalist list for the Blitnikoff Award, which goes to the best wide receiver in the country, which Alexander is not on, uh, there's nine guys that are finalists for that award. His numbers, both receive, uh, receiving yards and receptions, are better than everybody on the list, except for one guy, Freddie Barnes, Bowling Green's uh, wide receiver, whose numbers are just off the charts. He played here against mm -hmm. Missouri at the second game of the season, um, but since then, since he's gotten into conference play, his numbers are you know just out of this world. But uh, Alexander, I think, just belongs in the conversation with those guys. Now, unfortunately for him, he's not on that list because they only use the list. They start off with the list at the beginning of the season. The beginning of the season, I don't think many people really thought of Alexander mm -hmm. of being one of the best in the country. And then they whittle that list down as the season goes on. Uh, his only chance of being uh, added to the next list, which will be nine from nine people to three later this week, is if enough people write him in as a candidate, which did happen to Michael Crabtree two years ago. He wasn't on the initial list at the beginning of the year because he was a redshirt freshman, ended up winning the award. So I... I Will Alexander make it? I'm not sure, but I think he will have a chance for, for All-American. And I think as the season keeps going with three more games to go, I think this year will at least be considered one of the best years a Missouri wide receiver's ever had, right up there with Jeremy Macklin's last two years, and then Justin Gage, what he did in the early part of this decade. Now, I'm always loath to say, here are the number five best all-time, because then you will forget somebody and then you get mounds of email, but sure. I would have five. Mel Gray? Henry Marshall, both from earlier eras when there weren't as much passing, but both right. uh, great players. Then Justin Gage, Jeremy Macklin, and I would put Alexander in there maybe as the fifth. Uh, not in any particular order, but I think yeah. those are maybe the top five in Missouri history. His, his body of work from his freshman year to this year obviously isn't the right. same as some of those guys. And a lot of that has to do with injuries and the rest of the cast that he had around him. But this year alone, I think, puts him in that category. Now, the one bad news to come out of the Kansas State game is Jared Perry uh, has a hairline fracture in his leg. He's not going to be able to play for the rest of the regular season. Uh, he was a guy that had almost 700 yards receiving on the year, so a, a good number two option. Without him, A, who do you think gets more catches, and B, does that affect Alexander's production one way or the other? Yeah, well, I don't think this injury should be overlooked too much because he was a pretty steady guy. Um, you know, quietly put up some pretty good numbers, had his best numbers of the year through through 10 games this year. So, you know, I, 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 I don't know. I, I wouldn't freak out about the loss either because I think what happens is the other receivers just move up in the order of progression when Blaine Gabbard drops back to throw a pass. I think Wes Kemp becomes your number two guy right now, and Jarrell Jackson, whose production has gone up each week, I think he also is in the mix there too to catch more passes. Um, and then they're also going to look at some younger guys. They're, they're going to see their roles expand, as they did in the second half of the Kansas State game when Perry was out. Uh, T.J. Moe and Rolandis Woodland right off the bat. Those two, I think we'll probably see them out there a little bit more this, this weekend and next. I don't know if they'll use Derek Washington more as a receiver or not, but he's a guy that can catch sure. the ball um, maybe more than you would think of a, of a normal running sure. back. Um, as far as just Alexander's production, do you think, I don't know if they really can go to him a whole lot more than they are, but, I mean, does, does it... Is he essentially hurt by the fact that now teams can absolutely just focus almost only on him, but then on the other hand, Missouri would have no reason to throw at the other guys as much? Right, and I don't know how much defenses really were focusing mm -hmm. on Jared Perry to where they're going to change what they right. were doing to the outside receivers. I, I think defenses are probably going to do the same thing because 
you really are defending the system and the, and the five guys that are out there, not just each indiv- individual one. If anybody's mm-hmm. getting extra attention, it's probably Alexander, and I, I doubt that'll change too much. Mm-hmm. Um, defensively, Missouri did a nice job stopping Kansas State. Kansas State is, is not an explosive offense, but they have been able to run on virtually any, everybody, including Oklahoma, leading right. up to that game. Did not run on Missouri. Didn't even get up to 100 yards. Um, Bill Snyder makes a comment after the game that at the, one of the keys was Missouri was able to just defend the run with seven guys. Most teams kind of bring up a safety, and then that's where Kansas State can get the occasional big play. Missouri doesn't do that, stops the run. How much carryover, though, do you think there is when you're facing, say, Iowa State now or Kansas that run different offenses? I mean, yeah. Well, they're much different structurally. I mean, Iowa State runs a spread offense that looks a lot similar to Missouri's than it does Kansas State's. Their offensive coordinator came from Rice last year, and he had a really successful mm-hmm. system at Rice. Uh, but they do like to, to run the ball and, and run it physically behind a, a big, strong offensive line, sort of like Kansas State. So uh, there might be some carryover in that way. They have a, a good offensive line and a good running back in Alexander Robinson. I was talking to Missouri's defense coordinator, Dave Steckle, yesterday, and that's the first thing he, he noticed is their offensive line, how – what a good job they do in the run and the pass. Uh, their quarterbacks have been sacked, some of the fewest in the, in the Big 12 and in the country this year. So I, I think it all starts up front in this game. And, I, you know, you, you, would, you would think there'd be some carryover because Missouri's front played very well. The line, I thought, played well, one of the most active games they've had. And, uh, and then the linebackers, too, were, were all over the place making plays. So I think in this game, you know, you expect that to carry over a little bit, but it is a different style, more spread out, more like what Missouri faced against Baylor a couple weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Um, Missouri becomes bowl eligible now with six wins with that victory on Saturday. What um, scenarios do you see playing out? What bowls could they possibly well, be? It's going starting with? to come into view a little bit, um, and you have to look at the whole Big 12 when you talk about where Missouri's going to fit in. Right now, I, I'm leaning towards them playing in the Insight Bowl, uh, which is New Year's Eve and Tempe against a Big Ten opponent. Uh, you know, there's other things that could change that. I think the factors to look at is does the Big 12 only get one or two teams in the BCS? Right now, I think we assume it's just going to mm-hmm. be Texas. That is, if they win their game in the Big 12 championship game and, and win out before then also. Um, but if two teams should get in, Oklahoma State probably be the other one that could have a chance. If, if they win out, they would have to beat Oklahoma and Norman. Then I think they could be an at-large team, and that would bump everybody up a spot in the pecking order and, and maybe bump Missouri up to, uh, to the Sun Bowl where they played a few years ago or, uh, or maybe being in contention for the Holiday Bowl um, because – Missouri, we're presuming they would be seven and five or eight and four. Those teams have to go to a bowl earlier than a six and six team. So um, Oklahoma and Texas Tech are also six and four right now. If they should slip and and, and lose out, then uh, you know a seven or eight win team would go ahead of them. And another thing to look at is uh, if Kansas State beats Nebraska in the Big Twelve North Championship mm-hmm. game this weekend in Lincoln. Um, then I think both of those teams would probably slide above Missouri in the pecking order. Just Kansas State with their tradition of traveling well and ending the season on a, on a decent note, too. So lots to still happen, but I'm thinking right around that inside bowl spot is where Missouri seems likely to go at this point. So a seven-win team can go ahead of an eight-win team, but a six-win team can Right. The, go ahead I think of the six and six teams have to wait until it's all everybody that's better than them goes first. Okay, and lastly, I think you got some viewer mail this week. Yeah, viewer mail question, question from uh, Chris Ferguson from Overland Park. We'll overlook the fact that he's on the, the Kansas side of, uh, of the border there, but uh, kind of something we touched on earlier. But at Kansas State, Alexander had 200 of two, Missouri's 298 receiving yards. Are there concerns with the lack of passes going to other receivers? With Perry out if, uh, for the next two games, it seems like that it could become a one-man show. And Gary Pinkle actually used the line the other day. Uh, it's not going to be a one-man band, and referring to Alexander. Will Missouri spread the ball out with, with more of the young receivers or just keep uh, riding the Alexander train? Well, kind of touched on this a little bit, but earlier in the year it was interesting. After Alexander caught nine passes against Illinois, David Yost was, was ex- happy about that, but also he thought that they need to spread the ball more evenly around the rest of the receivers in the, in the offense. I think that line of thought has kind of evolved <laughs> over, as the years going on, mm-hmm. especially when Alexander goes the whole second half against Baylor with only two catches. So, you know, if, if he's open, throw him the ball. If he's not open, throw chances are he can probably still <laughs> catch it. Uh, you know, Blaine Gabbert made that comment the other day that he doesn't think he's ever not open. So mm-hmm. he's going he's gonna to look to him a lot, and I think that's good things happen when they do that. So uh, probably a combination of both. I think they'll still like to get those other guys involved. Um, because that's when the spread works well is when you're getting everybody involved. Uh, but I think when you've got Alexander as 
by far the best in this on this receiving core. You got to throw it to them early and often and late. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thanks, Dave. Uh, tune in next week. We'll discuss the Iowa State game and then look forward to Missouri's regular season finale against Kansas.